You're going to have an opportunity to make a first impression. What's that first impression going to be? And so really, what am I predicting? I don't know. It depends on each of the local businesses and how they behave when they get that first chance to make a first impression. Hey there, all you cool cats and kittens. This is Devin Hennig, VP of Demand Gen for Vendasta. You're in for a special treat. What you're about to hear is a conversation with some of Vendasta's executive team, specifically about what the heck is going on in local right now. Everything from predictions about local businesses themselves to how trusted experts can better help them succeed during COVID. That's everyone from agencies to media companies to tech vendors and... ISVs, MSPs, ICTs, all those fun acronyms. We're trying this out as a pilot, so please send us your feedback. If you like the format, we'll do more executive roundtables like this. If you don't like it, we've got thick skin. We can handle it. We just want to make sure we're bringing our audience value and maybe a little entertainment on Friday afternoons. Speaking of entertainment, this is a, this is a real cast of characters. We've got CEO Brendan King, CMO Jeff Tomlin, CTO Dale Hopkins, CSO Jackie Cook, GM of Marketplace Ed O'Keefe, EVP of Product Gib Olander, and Chief Customer Officer George Leith. If you've never met these folks, buckle up. This is basically what it's like to be in a fired up exec meeting with them, which is exactly what this roundtable's all about. So without further ado, let's get into it. This is a conversation with Vendasta's executive on what's happening in local right now and what you can do to win. I'm curious, two parts. If, ev if every one of you had to answer, number one, how have you personally felt it affect a local business? And number two, what is your prediction for the next six months and the next year? What I see is that every freaking business is almost open. It's really strange. And I'm driving down the road and go, well, they're open. It's an open sign. They're open. So for some reason, these small businesses are still going to their office, just like other people we know. And they are not giving up their home turf. And they're probably doing something there that is productive. They're not staying at home. I don't think they have their doors open, all of them. All the restaurants, you can see they have a, a sandwich board sign and it's drive by, pick the stuff up. But here's the places where you mail stuff. Here's a power tool companies and they're all open. I can look at, like I'm studying it in fascination because we're under rules to stay at home. Yet if you, if I drive, they're all open. There's no customers, but they're all open. So it's really, so what's, what's I don't know what that means. Months? What, what do you think's happening in the next six months to a year? For us? Oh, I think it, we're just going to bounce back to, uh, brick and mortar being open big time. Uh, I think there's going to be a blitz of people. All of us humans wanted to go back and touch and feel and be <laughs> brick and mortar customers. I think they're going to see a spike in, uh, and I hope that they've spent this time to polish themselves up, rearrange their, their merchandise, you know, dust it off, re-merchandise themselves and uh, get ready for this, you know, this blitz that they're going to have. George, how about you? Right now versus well, next six months. We've talked to a lot of uh, partners, resellers, uh, and it's interesting. There, there seems to be this common thread that if, if you were putting off your transition to digital, this is the catalyst that will get you, you know, on track. You need, you need to be further down the road. So there are certain businesses that are kicking their ass right now that they didn't do e-commerce when they knew they needed to do it. Um, but then there also are other organizations that, that are saying, you know, we're going to now double down on that transition, move budget, do whatever we need to do to double down on that transition, because we don't want to be caught with our pants down if this were to happen again. We'll look back at this as the moment where that digital transformation really started to rock it up, uh, ratchet up or whatever wording you want to use. That's what I'm hearing across the board from people that, that you know, they really want to capture this opportunity. I like the ratchet up. We might change the pants down, but that's fine. Dale, what's your uh, Dale? What's your take? 
I, uh, <clears throat> ben Galley talks, uh, he's the EIR for our, uh, he basically is the facilitator for our Reforge course. And one of the concepts he talks about is this marginal consumer. And so the marginal consumer is essentially the person that's not buying your product today, but would buy it in under the proper scenario. And what's happened with COVID that's really interesting is a whole bunch of marginal consumers have been pushed to try products that they probably would have tried, except for that they hadn't been pushed. And then the interesting part I think is going to be is that while that COVID's happening, People are trying all these products that they, you know, they wouldn't have tried before, but those marginal consumers, the question is, is whether people are going to recognize them as such and actually welcome them and make it a great experience. And so for me, the two examples I have is click and collect was a bull experience. I didn't get any of my groceries. I absolutely hated it. I will never do click and collect again. And so this is something where like, I obviously had to try out an online grocery pickup service and they the bed and I will not try it again. However, I've had other services where it's like, hey, I can go in, I can order something, I can pick it up and it kicks ass. I may change my behavior. So the interesting part is I think that during COVID, you have this opportunity to make a first impression that you otherwise would not have because I was never going to do click and collect beforehand. So, I mean, I think that the question is really up to the local business is you're going to have an opportunity to make a first impression. What's that first impression going to be? And so really, what am I predicting? I don't know. It depends on each of the local businesses and how they behave when they get that first chance to make a first impression. You know, Dale, that's funny you say that because my wife, she's picky and she hates to go to Superstore anyway because it's crowded. But she used this order stuff, drive up, go to a spot, come, they come out to your car. And she thinks it's the best thing that ever happened. And she's like, I'm never going to go back in that store again. And that's, that's the individual <laughs> side of it that's crazy. Because even at uh, one of the one of the people's from Instacart at, at one of our Reforge classes, and you had two different people. One of them said, you know what? I went to Instacart during COVID and it was awesome. I don't think I'm ever going to buy groceries again. And then we had another person go in and they're like, yeah, like the guy totally did a sh uh, botched all my groceries. I will never use yeah. Instacart again. So she'll never use Instacart again either. She, so well, she'll, she goes to the store, the superstore. Yeah, that they bring it out, and apparently they do a fantastic job. But the Instacart is random. What might? Oh happen. yeah, but this is the interesting part: is is that everybody gets a chance. Like the, the the craziest part is for the marketing group is the hardest thing you guys fight for is to get somebody to give you a chance. And COVID is putting that in your lap in a lot of these cases. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? And most businesses are utterly unprepared and are going to sh the bed on their first experience because they got forced into a first experience before they were ready to have a first experience. It's like, I don't know, it was like the, the girl you were going to ask to prom instantly decided you're going to go on a date tonight. And the answer is, sh I'm not ready for this. You know, along those lines, what, I, what I've been thinking on that has been that it's self-isolation has been long enough now to break habits, right? What, what, what's the stat? It's like 21 days to break a habit. And I wonder, and I've been trying to think long-term of how many consumer and buying habits are going to be completely broken. Like people didn't, were mindlessly doing just what they do, where they're now open to choice for the first time maybe in their entire life because what they used to do isn't available to them anymore. And so it'll be really interesting to draw after COVID-19 or as we start to come out of, of, of isolation of what habits will we want to pick up again and which ones are our consumers going to be happy that they shed and new opportunities are going to be available. So I don't think there'll ever be a going back to the way it was. I think it's you've got to start to anticipate what's the new, and I hate the new normal as a phrase, but what does the world look like? And We've got a whole generation of people that over the next, maybe it's not six months, Devin, but it's probably over the next five years that are going to make fundamentally different buying decisions, behavioral decisions because of this event. Like it, it's changing their framework of what's important to them, of how they perceive the world, of how they interact with things, how they learn, that, um, that, that smart businesses are going to find a way to be in front of that curve and try to anticipate. And I think that's the great opportunity that we're at right now. Well, and, and Devin, add, add to that on, on Vendasta, I think the interesting part is we're giving away all these remote toolkits and it's all about this, like, Hey, go ahead and figure out remote. And the interesting part for you guys is going to be figuring out those users that want to talk to people in person. This whole online thing is bullshit and they're using our platform because they have to versus the people that are trying it out and potentially would actually really like to keep doing it that way. And if we can figure out who those people are and make sure that they get a great experience, that's going to mean we're going to get people that keep staying with the platform. The, the playing field has tilted. 
Now, the big companies, the Googles, the Facebooks, they're going to take advantage, the Intels, the Apples, they're going to take advantage of this and they have a huge advantage. Small businesses are in serious trouble. They don't have the ability to adapt to these new habit changes that Gib pointed out at the same rate. So that, that, that's, that's the third one. And then the fourth macroeconomic change is, and you're going to see a lot of this, is, and it might lead to inflation and it might not, but it would be two years out, um, is we're going to bring back a lot of the things that other, fact, other places have done. So we're going to bring back the ability to build our own pharmaceuticals in North America. It's just going to happen, guaranteed. Don't care what anybody says, and it should happen. The other thing that's the other thing I've been doing it for the last six months. The other thing that uh, that people are that are talking about the last one I'll just talk about really quick. I think the fifth one is is the ability to build stuff. Like um, if you look at what the has happened in Asia, they've just built stuff. And they people come to that infrastructure. And North America hasn't really been like that. And so if you listen to Elon Musk, he talks about his dreadnought factories, about just you you can build stuff in North America with a robot just as cheap as you could build it with people somewhere else. But it's been it's just the the will to build stuff hasn't been there. The the actually uh the one of the Kleiner Perkins VCs wrote a really good article on this that I could share with everybody, but it's just just build. And we should be building out the infrastructure of our, of our economy. First responders are getting more uh, respect and attention than they've ever gotten. Probably, you know, not as much as they deserve, but they're getting it. You know, and there's also a movement to uh, protect local and support local businesses. In fact, if you see some of these big fat cats that you mentioned, taking some of this uh, this relief money, they're having to give it back. You know, where no, you know, you've got this giant quadzillion dollar chain and they're giving it back. And I think consumers have a new awareness of, uh, of small businesses and how valuable they are. I mean, I, I know personally that I literally miss walking into some places and I really want to sit down and be served at a restaurant really but you're badly. But you to buy from Amazon. So anyway. Yeah, but I sh of course I will. So here's my second my second point that uh, on that is that there's this other thing happening that you know these new breed of B2B buyers, which are the SMBs, who want to buy from one trusted place, right? They um, this we're already seeing it just in our own company. We're seeing company you know our our own clients who sell to these small businesses who we've asked, you know, adopt the platform, adopt the platform, adopt the whole platform, make it your own. Here you go. It's all yours. All of a sudden we're looking, we look at their site and we're like, whoa, you did it. We've been begging you for six months, eight months to do it. We've been humping your leg off to do this. And all of a sudden they've done it. This thing forced them to realize that to serve the new breed of B2B buyer, yeah. these agencies, these cloud brokers, have to be full service, full provisioning, full scale, and expandable and scalable. And so it's it's really fascinating to see them adopt a platform all of a sudden instead of a point solution. These point solutions that are out there that are laying off people, unfortunately, are in big freaking trouble. Can I can I go well, one more? GL and GAC got to get a topic here real quick, and then next topic. I know. I just want to take it one back up and then I'll shut up about it. I'll let you guys talk. But what about the change in sports? Like, listen to this. And the, Gib, you're going to hate this, but I'm so fucking happy that suddenly teachers and health educators and other people are more important than that bullshit sporting people on the other side. Like, I don't care if it ever comes back, to be honest with you. And I'm just, I, I know that's controversial, but I don't like the salaries those guys get compared to people who are teaching my kids, compared to people who are working in the hospital, compared to those things. So anyway, that's that's it. I've long debated that teachers should be the highest paid people in every country. So no. I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. No. Great there's, there's Brennan, but, but, the great but, communist. No, but you know, you to pay to see teachers. So <laughs> sorry. I support this a thousand percent. You know what? The, but the change that's happening today is going to start to make that happen. If you look at Peloton, right? Like a great instructor on Peloton, they just said that they had 25,000 people in their class. So world-class educators and world-class leaders 
with this change are going to get a chance to actually become the stars that they deserve because access to their information and learning from the greatest that whoever it is is going to be available to you now. And yes. so that change is going to happen where, you know, you're going to pay to see the Peloton instructor more than you're going to pay to see Sammy Sosa. Gib, are you and saying that by changing from having your only employer as the government, you change your career prospects? No. Okay, 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 okay. Too, too much sausage fest. Jackie, come on. <laughs> Balance this out. What's, what's your prediction? They, okay, there's three points that I want to talk about. Um, the one is um, – we can be remote and it can be okay. And I think a lot of a lot of companies and a lot of business practitioners are waking up. I had a, a fantastic physio session remotely with a good friend of mine. And number one, I actually have the time as a consumer to do physio. I've been putting it off for literally years, but I, now that it's remote, can fa find time in between bedtimes to do that. And from her perspective, she can find time in between her toddler's bedtimes to do it as well. So we see this tremendous flexibility in both the consumer side and the practitioner side, or, and you can apply that to many, many different business models. Um, the second thing, so we can be remote and it'll be okay. Um, the second thing is I think it's Amara's law we talk about a lot. Technology has been slowly causing small businesses to become obsolete. And I think this Amazon effect is actually what's sort of slowly killing the economy. And I think what happened recently is the swift kick in the butt that we all needed to change our buying habits. And what I mean by that is, I would love to buy Lex's clothes, for example, from a local supplier, but it's so much easier because Amazon's one click away to do so. And the hope that a small business locally could actually be one click away and that they're having to do it now because we are remote, I think we've, we've prevented sort of a, a long, dark, slow death by having to force them to do it right away or them having to force to do it right away. Um, the other thing is I think because of that, we've all started to recognize as consumer how much we appreciate local experiences and the human effect. And I think us as buyers, um, we recognize that, wow, the Amazons of the world pose an immense like threat to our um, friends and our local communities. And I think we're going to spend the extra $4 on an item to purchase it from someone remote or someone local because we love the idea of being able to go into the store and knowing that they will still be there um, when we do want to go to it. And the last point I'll lead with is I think there's going to be this low, this surge of um, and revivance of local supply chains. We have decentralized and distributed so much of supply chains that one cog in the wheel comes here, another cog comes there. And it works really well when the economy is humming. And as we've seen is as soon as it stops, if you can't get one of those cogs in your machine, um, the whole thing falls apart. And so I think everything from food and the way we source our meat to the way that um, even we build our products, people are going to start looking at local suppliers and local sources, even if it means um, costing a little bit more. Um, so yeah, that's it. And maybe even local toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> you could go vegetarian like Brendan. You know? I love that. Local supply chains. Jeff, you're last. Get us with some insights. Um, I mean, like the others said, uh, and uh, Mary Meeker, like, I think this will be the great leveling up event um, for for people that, that lagged uh, digital adoption. Um, I, you know, we're going to see e-commerce come to, 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 to businesses that didn't have it. One, but one thing that maybe hasn't been talked about, so I won't dwell on that. You guys talked about that quite a bit. Um, what Dale. <laughs> Dale <King's laughs> after. <laughs> Awful. Awful. Uh, mother screwed you. Somebody screwed you. I don't know. I did not know. Nice. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Fine, Everybody I'll show your hands. I'll take my ball and go home. Uh, um, so, Devin, <clears throat> what I was saying was... I agree with a lot of what these people have said and, and uh, the Mary Meekers out there that this will be the great leveling up event. Oh, man. Have you blocked me again? Fucking no. asshole. That's all through. 
<laughs> and uh, so I think it will be the great leveling up event for all the people that lagged with their um, digital adoption. Um, but maybe one thing that wasn't talked about and that I, I, I wonder about will be the markets where they, they have interlopers and what will happen to interlopers. When we were in the real estate space, they called the uh, lead generators interlopers um, that came in and started skimming money off the, off the industry. And I think that, I mean, they're also called aggregators. I think in industries where aggregators added value because the industry itself was inherently inefficient, um, like uh, travel was an example of one that was really inefficient. Um, uh, they'll continue to be successful and they'll grow and probably grow even more with people buying uh, a lot more uh, online. Uh, but I, then I wonder about the other industries where you have interlopers that um, just took advantage of laggards. And so one example of that is like the skip the dishes. So I don't think the, the food delivery service was inherently uh, inefficient. It wasn't inefficient for Cafe 244 to, for me to order takeout from them and uh, for them to, to hire a driver. Uh, they just, uh, Skip the Dishes just saw an opportunity where a whole bunch of restaurants weren't actually marketing themselves and they uh, stole their brand and skimmed their audience off the top and skimmed off a bunch of margin from the, uh, a bunch of business from the, the restaurants. So uh, what I wonder is uh, will this great leveling up event um, cut into 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 the interlopers like them um, uh, that uh, that sort of intercepted or, or wedged their way into an industry that wasn't really inefficient? They just saw opportunities. It, I, I it hope. Might, I, yeah, I, it might, Jeff. But you know, at the same time, this is sprouting a bunch of cottage industries too, right? You know, if you think about what's happening with some of these uh, auto dealerships, they're delivering cars now. Yeah. People are buying cars and they're being delivered to homes mm. or businesses. There is a cottage industry already that sprouted up that is mm. sterilized delivery. Yeah. You know, there, and then there's also these cottage industries that are, I sterilize planes. That's what yeah. I do. I have my little smoking electronic, I don't know what the steamy thing it is. And I do that and this, they're, they're rolling out these billion dollar businesses sterilizing planes and there's a bunch of cottage industries that are that are going to sprout up that just from a you know a a, um, yep. a, a economic standpoint it it probably will not uh, it'll it'll supplant some of the stuff that we lost that will just permanently be gone right uh, so you know we should come out yeah whole or better you know it's just different it's a new different Anyway, my hope, my hope with uh, on the interloper front is that uh, businesses like two four four take back, uh, you know, the margins and business that yep. they've lost to places like Skip. If you were running an agency right now, if you were dropped in CEO of an agency this second, what would you do? What would you be waking up and doing tomorrow? So reverse order, uh, Jeff, hot take, like two or three lines. If I was, I, I don't know. I need, I need a, I need a minute. Pass. Ah, pass. Okay. Okay, sure. I'm ready. Jack. I got two, two, two things. One is I'd get really close to my existing customers, and I'd give them tools in their hands right away, and set up one-to-many broadcasts on how to get the most out of those tools. So, for example, cool. real practical yeah. things, I would set up a webinar with here's how to get online. Basic, 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 basic for free. And in doing so, I would establish trust with my existing customers who help, um, who might be going through a tough time at that point. But in doing so, you don't lose that point of contact with your existing customers. Secondly, there's a massive wave of other businesses looking to go online right now. So I would also take these toolkits and I would get them in the hands of a whole bunch of other customers that I've never served before. And I would use the same tactics on here's how to get online. And then I would simply educate, educate, educate and be that source of of knowledge and not just knowledge about the coronavirus and covid because there's enough of that going around true knowledge on ways that they can get found by customers in this time and bring in data around you know so like one piece as we were looking the other day and the search for digital agencies on google that keyword alone has just surged like people are looking for help right now as well so i would look at other things what are other consumers looking for right now and how can you match 
increase in demand, we have a whole bunch of markets that are going up and fluctuating right now and meet that with um, what we've got in our customer base as well. Love it. Webinars, toolkits, teach. Yeah. Brendan. I 100% agree with Jackie. I would go to my existing customers if I had them and uh, I would make sure that I was stacking them all right up. I wouldn't even look, be looking for new customers. I'd be taking my existing customers and making sure that they had everything they needed to get through this because there's enough. Uh, you have a relationship already. It's in a hurry. They have time and I'd be building them up the stack if I could. I probably would buy for, uh, look at my break them up into courts and say who's going to make it and who's not and uh, go that way. Um, I also would then, for new customers, I'd pick a couple of places where I knew I could help. I'd take either a gym or, or a, a church and say we can help hold a service. I'd do whatever it took to, to put a, something in place to copy what other people I, I have tremendous success on and quickly follow behind those. And, um, and there's tons of examples and then drive them up. That's what I would do as an agency owner. Good, good, good. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's kind of three big trends I think that I would I would think about mostly. I, at first, I would double down on social and be doing absolutely everything and anything I could to build an audience and try to collect as much first party data and build those relationships so that I would be ready to communicate with those people when they were able to buy from me. And again, it depends a little bit on the vertical that you're in, but no matter what, I would be gathering and building because I think that's the most valuable thing that they can have. The second is I'm looking at with my customers and trying to figure out how to help reduce vendor clutter, both reduce their cost and create a centralized operating system for their software basis. So I would become somewhat of a cloud broker or a consultant to them to help them streamline the operation of their business into a centralized operating system. And then the third thing that I would do is I would try to lean into everywhere that I could a real true product led approach that people, because they've got more time and that they're at home researching and learning before they're making buying decisions, I would try to find whatever product I had and position it in front of those customers so that they could feel it, see it, experience it without actually having to come into my business uh, to the best of their ability. So those would be the three things that I'd focus on. I like that. I like the operating system, the product-led approach. So was a bit fuzzy. What are you doing on social? What's, to me, it's uh, what's all about, to me, it's all about building an audience, right? So it's whatever kind of content that I can create, whatever kind of giveaway that I can do, a sign up, an education, a webinar. But the whole purpose is create content to generate an audience because that audience is what you own. That's the only thing you can actually get that becomes an asset for you later, right? So if you can get that audience now, while people can't spend money, you'll be so far ahead whenever the floodgates do open up or if there's a V curve or an L curve or a U curve, it doesn't matter. You need an audience and today's tools allow you to become your own publisher, your own voice, your own network like never before. And many of these businesses have never thought of an audience that way. So how can you gather an audience? Because that's a long-term valuable asset that will pay off time and time again. Nice. Can I just jump in on something Ed, uh, Gib said? I think it's super cool. And we talked about this yesterday, Devin. There's two trends that are happening right now as well. One is this idea of cutting costs. Like, holy cow, I got to go through all my credit card bills and just start cutting costs. The other is cleaning up, cleaning the house, the clean co army, right? Everyone's like, especially people that aren't working or like cleaning things with tooth, every, it's crazy. And I think there's a real opportunity. Everyone's taking a breath right now, a moment right now to really explore what is the foundation that I want for the future. And both small businesses and local businesses setting up the infrastructure for, for growth in the future, as well as our own customers. They're, they're, you know, I've been on a couple saves call and you know, I'm cutting costs, I just need to cut Vendasta. And then once we talk to them, they're like, you guys, what do you mean you have a sales CRM, a whole pipeline management, a whole task, and I can get rid of Monday.com, I can get a pipe drive, I can get, I can consolidate even all of my solutions and you'll give me a bulk discount rather than um, you know grabbing 10 or 12 vendors for all my products. If I actually consolidate with you, you'll give me a better cost. Jackie, your internet is so much because better than when you're- You should really help our customers too. <laughs> That's it. That's why we're different than Salesforce, HubSpot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, but we, we don't say that online. online, man. We're getting we we got a I, Jeff's got a plan. I know he's got a plan, but we don't do the vendor clutter thing yet or the cost cutting thing. We, we should. Come we on. Oh, Come I've on. Call out the website. 
Okay, okay, we gotta move on. George, George, take us through the the, the, leaf, the leaf vision. What is Leaf Agency doing? Listen, they're submitting some great concepts. I agree with uh, none of them, um, but I will. <laughs> no, I agree with the majority of them. But one thing that I I think you know, you're not in traffic driving to see a customer. You're not in traffic driving to your office. So you could take some of that time and to level up your team's learning, because we talk about that you need to have constant learning. But now we actually have the time to do some of that stuff. So inside your agency to pick where the gaps are in, in the development of those people and those teams and really put an effort into the hours. And, um, you know, I've professed this for a number of years and, and it's hard to do because the whirlwind gets you. And over the last six weeks, I've actually been doing it for hours and hours a day. And it's hard. Um, it, it takes a lot of discipline. And if you're going to do three hours of training, you got to do six hours of prep. Um, but we do have that time um, now to level that team up. So, you know, that would be my one thing I'd add to all the other great concepts that have been discussed in the last few minutes is that this really is an opportunity to level up with some of that time that you would be spending, you know, doing things in the whirlwind. Subscribe to the podcast, everybody. That was that was very that was good. That was nice. I like that. Dale. I would say don't change. Um, I don't think I don't think cutting makes sense. Keep your shit tidy on a day to day. It doesn't make sense that now's the time that oh we should think about our business. It's like I don't know. It maybe if you weren't keeping things tidy, that that's going to be a problem. But like that that isn't going to change for me. And then I think that the real difference is going to be research. Like I think George is talking about here. And I think really you're you're supersizing your current customer focus and the idea of I'm not a cost, I'm a, I'm a partner. And so that means that I'm going to be basically figuring out for my top partners how to save them. I'm going to be looking into programs and be looking into stuff like this. But honestly, I'm not changing my day to day. I'm I'm literally figuring out for my top partners the the services Vendasta and other people offer and how I'm going to help them adapt their business. But that's what I do because I'm their partner. Right. Like, so for me as an agency, shit hasn't changed. It's just like, guess what? Maybe I got a little complacent because it hadn't changed in a while. But the reason my partners pay me is because I'm watching what's happening and telling them what to do. I'm going to show up as the expert and tell them what to do just another day. To Brendan's thing earlier today, the most frustrating fucking thing is when you've shown them something in the platform for three <laughs> years and finally one day they go, oh my God, you have that? Yeah. You have that? It's a catalyst that drove them to that moment. And, and it's that constant repetition. Um, it's a real hard thing to make a part of, of your, your day to day. So I just wanted to throw that in something I just thought of as Dale was discussing. You know, um, it, 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 on the agency side of things, I would absolutely 100% focus on e-commerce solutions right now. One of the, like the biggest problem people are having right now is that their cash register isn't ringing uh, as much as it used to, and the door isn't swinging. And uh, it is easy, e especially with our new solution, it is uh, easier and easier for, for them to enable their business with e-commerce. And I, I think I think Brennan touched on this, um, but I would absolutely find one or two maybe verticals um, that you can put together a really good solution for that you can repeat uh, and have repeatable motions or you can execute on a, a really excellent strategy and go through that vertical. But I think exactly what you're talking about, Jeff, like that's why you hire an agency is to, you know, to get the, the door to swing and the cash register to ring. And like what you have to do is maybe different, but in the end, the value proposition is different, is the same. Your job as an agency is to get them customers. And I mean, while how you do that may change, guess what? Do your homework, figure it out. But like, they still want the same thing that they paid you to do. The question is, how are you going to do it? No, okay. no, I, okay. No, nope, sorry. Ed, sure, Ed, take us home. Yeah. Um, so agencies and, and media companies, they run hard. They run hard daily, every minute. You know, we see it every day. They're sweating, working hard. Uh, and I respect them so much. Uh, if I was an agency, I would take a minute to take my vitamin C and my vitamin D and my zinc and take care of myself personally, eat better and work out a little more and go for walks right now and just get, you know, a little more healthy. But I, I would also do the same with my business. I would uh, certainly put all my customers on uh, 
automated drip campaigns to give them, make sure I'm top of mind, make sure that they know I'm, I'm there and taking care of them. I'd put any tools and any proof of performance that I've had in the past in their laps on a repeated basis so they remembered me. And then I take inventory of my product set and uh, how I'm doing business. And I would look around for places where I can be staged to be more potent and more powerful when uh, the consumers open up and the, and the SMBs open up to, to buy faster and quicker. Uh, for instance, finding marketplaces where they can get uh, you know, volume and, and global buying power with uh, almost a co-op of other SMBs and other, uh, other agencies and really come out of the gate with a stronger product set that's appropriate for the times Probably the tip of the spear would be e-commerce, you know, uh, but it all, would also have that element of freemium and trials, and that that would be my my thing. But I would take a time to to get healthy uh, really quick, remerchandise like myself. I couldn't tell if that was a metaphor at the start or not, but it turns out it was both. So that's correct. That's perfect. Okay, we and got like... see more on no, <laughs> it's yeah, whatever. Thing. Okay, well, we got five minutes Paradox. left. Paradox. Um, I, I think that was helpful. I think that was fun. It would be really neat to know what you guys thought at even the next deeper level. Like, give, you mentioned giveaways. What are really cool giveaway ideas? Ed, you mentioned drip campaigns. Like, what would you be saying in those? Like, maybe that's something we could dig into in future weeks. But um, maybe last question, I guess. If it was a real quick round the horn, like, what... What's the biggest challenge right now? What's the most exciting thing right now? Like, I can either be building this platform itself, like from the Vendasta perspective, what's the biggest challenge and what's the most exciting thing? And from the cloud broker side, what's the biggest challenge? What's the most exciting thing? All right, well, going the opposite way again. So I'll start so I can get out of here. Take it. <clears throat> and that is that um, I'm super excited about the week going away. And the strong and the ones that are healthy, um, really being there to serve uh, their customers better than the weak ones were. I think we were, uh, as buyers at the SMB level, at the consumer level, we were okay with some adequacy. And uh, that is weeded out. The weak are gone. Unfortunately, fortunately, you know, sorry, that's brutal, but they are. And the strong ones that were trying to serve well, that were in that chatter and that shape and that noise um, are now front and center. The consumer is going to get a lot better service. The SMB is going to get a lot more service from the agencies. We're going to serve agencies better because we're focused on the best ones, the healthy ones. And it's just going to be a tighter, better ecosystem going forward. I'm very excited about that. Right on. Thank you. Dale. I think exciting is our position's amazing. We're sitting in a you know a tough time in the market. We've got lots of cash. Um, we can we can literally do what everybody wants is to have cash in a hard time, and so we can you know we can be a little bit more flexible and buy the market. It's crazy. Like to be in our position is insane compared to like you know someone like Seven Shifts that was about to close a deal. They're starved. They're hungry, and then closes like right before like it doesn't close. Like they're in the worst possible position. And I think of our competitors like people like you know or, or even partners like people like TripAdvisor. Like they're stuck. Whereas as we're not, and in terms of challenging, I think it's how do we get more data to understand exactly what's happening and instrument the whole place? Because there's so many great ideas. I just need more data to help me decide which ones, because like this organization's so full of great stuff. How do we focus? Gib. So I, I can echo some of the things that, that Dale just said. The, the, as I think about what are our biggest challenges right now as we're building out our platform, it's um, that it's, We've got less accurate vision of what the future is going to look like than probably ever before. As we talked about earlier, habits are changing, the consumers are changing, the market's changing, but we know that we need to act incredibly fast and incredibly quickly and iterate and iterate and iterate. So it is a time to take a data-driven approach to get things out into the market and test them as fast as you can 
gather that data and then make smart decisions on what you iterate on next and how you make things world-class. So I'm super excited about that. It gives us the opportunity to use data to predict and define the things that work best to solve the problems that people need solved. Uh, and, and so from that perspective, it really brings you back to the basics. And I think that's exciting. You're here. Amen. Brendan. I'm not sure I need data to tell me that my wife's mad at me. I mean, she is, but uh, let me let me explain what I mean here. We are at war, and uh, there is a huge opportunity. And the bigger companies, and I've said it before, are positioned to win because they have the most sort of mind share for this. And um, who are we at war with? Well, consumers need to get online. They're going to look to Shopify. They're going to look to Wix, and we can't compete directly with those guys. But we can compete with the people they're going to help with the people that they're going to turn to, those trusted local experts, we can compete. And so if we can win that battle, if we can convince those people that it is uh, that that it's uh, it's better to build your own brand and your own recurring revenue rather than a Wix or a Shopify, they'll choose us. And if uh, and, and in order to make that happen, we got to move like the wind because we weren't ready for the e-commerce toolkit and we weren't ready for our platform to be there and help teach them and learn and grow and build a community. But I think we're, I think we're close. So the biggest challenge is for us to be agile, uh, get alignment and drive it through over and over. Like we've got the ideas, but it's, you, you might think that I'm a broken record lately and I'm just going to be one. And I want all you guys to be a broken record. We need to drive alignment, drive alignment, continue to work, continue to push so that, in six months, we don't look back and say, F we missed it. Simple as that. It's like the wind. That's I great. Was, I was going to say the thing that I'm bullish, uh, most bullish about uh, is pace that I've seen. Uh, the, the, willing, the, the willingness of people to make decisions quickly and their willingness to change, build, and innovate quickly. Uh, and then the thing that I'm... Uh, it gets me down a little bit about the whole situation is the pace of change. This is the exact same thing. Jackie. Yeah, I think um, I'll offer something that I think will be a challenge and then uh, something that I'm hopeful with. I, I think the challenge is really going to be uh, both for Vendasta and for all of our partners and small businesses is cutting through all the noise. Um, there's a ton of noise out there right now. Um, you know, even educating what we can do for our partners, what our partners can do for their SMBs, and what the SMBs are really trying to say, hey, we're here, we're open, we're available, we're we're here to serve you. It's really difficult when there's a whole bunch of fear mongering and um, noise out there. So I think that in general is the more we can have all of us a crystal clear story um, to connect with with the consumer buying changes, changes that are happening right now, the better off everyone will be. Um, the thing that I'm most hopeful about is um, like as luck would have it again, we just happen to be at the right place at the right <laughs> time again. And it's just this incredible, you know, we talk about when we raised a round of financing last year about how small businesses were making this shift to digital and it's been slowly building. And I feel it's almost like this surf wave and COVID was the wave curling and now it's like wham and to Brendan's point we can either be there to catch it or we can miss the wave and we can sit back on our surfboards mm -hmm. and um and see it kind of drift away from us and so you know you read like I've been reading a lot of Ray Dalio and Mary Meeker and some of these economists and thought leaders and almost everything they're saying is like speaking to our soul because it's like we're here we're ready we're, we're now and um, the other cool thing is I think we've never as an organization been so crystal clear and laser focused on our mission. Um, you know, it's a difference between seeing a statement written on a wall or on a website um, and truly seeing your favorite restaurant or hair salon or whatever down the street putting up a closed sign. And um, I think it's been, you know, a, a rocky couple of weeks, but it's really allowed us to band together as a company and um, feel what we're doing and not just kind of do it. Good God. Awesome. So many nuggets. Time the movement. Everything. Best story wins. We're a movement. I love that. Hey, well, I appreciate it. Guys. Right, we're gotta, over, roll. But, uh, gotta go get it done. I, uh, I had fun. I don't know about you guys. Hopefully we can do this again. Courtney, I think we got a lot to go off of.
I don't know that Dale knows the difference between interlopers and antelopes. Well, maybe, you know, <laughs> conversation about that. But uh, anyhow, have a, good, have a good weekend, guys. I don't know. Is there anything else anyone want to say? or? Uh, that's a that's a good old boy's description of the antelope. Those interlopers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. The antelopers are interloping on my garden. Right on. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Have a great weekend. Thanks, man. Thanks, everybody. Oh, Cheers. Bye, that recording. Get rid of that recording. <laughs> <laughs>